and since even minimal human rights for dhimmis are conditional upon fulfillment of the dhimma, their lives are now completely uh, forfeit. Uh, coming to the end of what I want to say, I mentioned the charter of Hamas. Uh, I, also the Orwellian emphasis by the Obama administration on the Arab-Israeli um, peace process while ignoring basically the real threat which comes from a country which has leaders that are as radical as anything Al-Qaeda has. But unlike Al-Qaeda sitting in the desert, they are a highly educated nation of between 65 and 70 million trying to get the weapons with which to implement their, um, th their plan to destroy. Uh, I was going to talk, but I don't want to take this too long, about Islamic rage. I mentioned it in my book. When you look down upon a people and they ex you think they have accepted subordination to you, and then they turn around unexpectedly and they defeat you militarily. It is enraging. It, is also, it was also enraging in Germany in 1918. And if you want to see rage personified, just watch Adolf Hitler as he speaks. See? Once you have lost the battle, It's your whole masculinity which is now in question. And do not underestimate this. Uh, two final comments. Part of the reason, and here I'm a theologian, and when I look back on my life, I, I ask myself, well, because you know, I live in a town where there are a lot of financiers and senior corporate executives. And sometimes I say, well, why didn't I go to Harvard Law or Harvard Business School and make real money instead of just being comfortable? And at an early age, I realized that religion was a far more potent force in the world, even for a secular world, than most people realize. And the most dangerous thing about religion is when you think it's not influencing you, it has influenced you nevertheless. Example, one of the principal empirical examples of why Christianity is true and Christ is Lord and Judaism was wrong, was the destruction of the temple in the year 70. You find it in Justin Martyr. You find it in St. Augustine. You find it in Martin Luther. And St. Augustine made it possible for some kind of conditional relationship to exist between the... Uh, Christians and Jews. The formula was they may survive but not thrive because it was expected that the time would come when they would recognize, Christ would come back, they would recognize him and they would be rejoined to uh, the true covenant of Abraham. Incidentally, in that respect, uh, I responded in the Journal of Ecumenical Studies recently uh, Martin Marty wanted to know why some Jews are willing to work with uh, 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 conservative Christians who are pro-Israel. And he asked, as uh, do so many of the um, my Jewish friends, well, how can you work with people like that when 
all they're expecting is that in the end of days, Jesus will come back and you'll either accept Jesus or you will, uh, you will go to hell. How can you deal with a person like that? I have a very simple answer. If Jesus comes back and I recognize him, I will be the first to convert. Uh, I, I would say, don't count on it. I mean, that's one thing. But there's one respect in which there is something of a restraint and always has been in Christianity. As bad as Christianity could get, there was always the thought in Christianity some Jews had to survive. That is not true of Islam. There is no such restraint in Islam. That doesn't mean all is Muslims are out to, to get them or anything like that. What it does mean is the radicals will have no reason to stop if they are militarily uh, superior. Final word is some of the things which were said here before I spoke. I think we had better realize the choice which was made on behalf of the Jews in 1947. That choice was the election of Mamlach to youth choice of sovereignty. What does that mean? Sovereignty, and this is something that you find in Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan, is that condition in which you live in the state of nature with other sovereigns and you never get out of it. And there's always the danger that you may be destroyed. But what the Jews who would experience the Holocaust realized was that subordination only led to extermination. And so they would prefer sovereignty in which they at least had the chance to survive. And that undoubtedly is one of the reasons why David Ben-Gurion made sure that he had those nuclear weapons. He saw the immense Muslim populations, and he needed an equalizer. Now, the equalizers lasted a long time. Whether it will last any longer, I don't know. But I, for one, am much less interested in winning Muslim hearts and minds than finding credible ways to prevent them from destroying Israel and ultimately us. And that's part of what sovereignty is all about. Thank you.